Hello everyone, welcome back in the course of higher surveying and today we are going to start a new module called radar. It is module 8. If you recall the last module, radar is the active remote sensing technique where we have used the source of energy which was not the natural source of energy or radar uses its own source of energy. Similarly, radar is also an active remote sensing technique and we want to use the radar for the purpose of topographic mapping. So let us go ahead. We have series of five lectures in this module. And the first lecture that we are going to talk today is about the geometric aspects of the radar fundamental. And these are the books here, Introduction to Microwave Remote Sensing, Introduction to Modern Photogrammetry by Mikhail, and Principles and Applications of Imaging Radar. So these books are very, very expensive and one should go to some library or join some institute library to refer these books. This lecture series is sufficient enough for the fundamental knowledge. However, someone is interested in higher knowledge should definitely go to the library. The radar stands for radio detection and ranging. First of all, let us discuss the history of the radar. It has its own course of development. Originally, this was developed by Heinrich Hertz. He conducted his experiments from year 1800 to 1885. And during this period, he proved the existence of radar as well as its usefulness. Further, in 1904, the first patent was filed by the scientist Hilsmer and the filed patent was all about the detecting a ship using radar. Then, the concept of side-looking airborne radar came into 1940s and its sophisticated application came in 1950s. Thereafter, around 1960s, the radar was used for the civilian applications, for example, topographic mapping. The radar was first launched on a satellite in 1970s. Thereafter, it has been widely used as a satellite mapping system. Around 1990s, the airborne radar research started. So now it is almost 100 years old technology because it was invented originally around 1880 and so it is more than 100 years now. You can understand that how nicely it has been developed or how mature it is now. So let us start with the radar. Radar stands for the radio detection and ranging and it operates in the microwave region from 1 millimeter to 1 meter wavelength range. You can see these radar bands are indicated here, L band, S band, C band, X band and K band. It is an active sensor. The radar works in microwave wavelength range and that is why we use microwave remote sensing technique. So you might be surprised that why this radar has a radio detection here, but it is using the microwave. So we will get into this as we progress in this lecture. This is electromagnetic spectrum and microwave region if I indicate it is from this point here to this point here, 1 mm to 1 meter. And you can see that the major portion of this electromagnetic spectrum is transparent to the atmosphere, which means that someone who is on the earth surface, if he is sending the radar signal, it will pass through the atmosphere and it can go to satellite or maybe some other place. Similarly, radar signal, if it is sent from the satellite, it will definitely be received at the earth surface because complete atmospheric window is available for this range. And this region is called the microwave region. Now we are using a word radio detection and ranging and we are using the microwave region. So what is the difference between the two? So let us look into this. So microwave zone or the microwave wavelength range is given from 1 millimeter to 1 meter on the electromagnetic spectrum. And if I convert this 1 mm to corresponding frequency, assuming the speed of the light as 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. Then the 1 mm corresponds to 3 into 10 to the power 11 hertz and 1 meter corresponds to 3 into 10 to the power 8 hertz. Or I can write 300 megahertz frequency to 300 gigahertz frequency is microwave zone. Microwave zone has some speciality. It has high antenna gain. What is the meaning of high antenna gain? The antenna receives the signal so if I assume that there are some ideal conditions, that means speed of the light is ideal, atmosphere is ideal and there are no losses at all between the transmission from the satellite or the source. So in that case, I will have some value of the received signal. 
at the same time if I now assume that everything is real that means atmosphere is real speed of the light is not the way we assume it is actual value. So, using those real conditions if I find out the received signal of the antenna then if I take the ratio of the real case to the ideal case for the uh, received signal. So, I define this parameter as antenna gain. So, the antenna gain is very high in case of microwave reason and that is the reason we are using the microwave reason. Similarly, we have higher reflectivity of the received signal that means the surface where the signal is reflecting it is also behaving with high reflectivity in this microwave reason. Then it has large bandwidth that means the frequency range over which signal is transmitted it is called bandwidth. So, microwave reason is having very large bandwidth it travels by line of sight. Remember in case of lidar we have line of sight that means a line along which we send the transmitted pulse or transmitted signal. Similarly, in case of radar we can throw the signal in certain direction and the radar pulse or the radar signal will follow that direction and that is what we call the it travels in line of sight. So, now we can take advantage of this and we can do the topographic mapping. As we have already seen it penetrates through the ionosphere and it has minimum attenuation while it was traveling through the atmosphere or the ionosphere. So, what is the attenuation? Attenuation is the reduction in the magnitude of signal. Similarly, it will have distortion. So, distortion is change in the shape of the signal. So, the shape of the signal will not be changed or it will change minimum as well as the magnitude of the signal will be reduced by minimum quantity. Finally, the noise level is very very low in this particular range 1 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz within the microwave region. What is the meaning here? If the signal is of low strength still we can detect it because the noise level is minimum. And what is the role of noise? If it is comparable with the original signal it will confuse the receiver whether it is a noise or it is a signal and that is why we always expect low amount of noise. In this range 1 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz we have very low level of noise inherently in the signal and that is the advantage. We have some applications like space communication for satellites and GPS and the radar. So, all these applications are possible in the microwave region. What about the radio frequency? First of all radio frequency overlaps or it contains the microwave region. That means, radio frequency starts from 1 mm to 1 kilometer but it is quite a wide range. If I convert the wavelength range to the frequency it will be 300 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. Moreover, this range of 1 millimeter to 1 kilometer also contains the 1 millimeter to 1 meter range which is the microwave region. So, now what are the applications? You might have heard that RF IDs, radio frequencies IDs. That means there is some small chip which is sensitive to the radio zone, not in the microwave, but in the re remaining part of the radio frequency zone. And now we put RF IDs for the purpose of identification. For example, if I want to identify car, I can put it there and I will have a remote and I will use it. So, other applications are the mobile phones, and then we have amplitude modulated or frequency modulated radios what we call this radio FM or radio Mirchi all these are FM radios and then we have the television. So, all these are applications in the radio frequency zone. So, I hope that the difference between the radio frequency zone and the microwave region is clear to you. So, what are the microwave bands? That means from 1 mm to 1 meter wavelength range of electromagnetic spectrum how these range is divided. So, this definition is more popular by IEEE. So, IEEE has divided this a wavelength range into high frequency, very high frequency, ultra high frequency, L band, S band, C band, X band, K U band, K band, K A band, V band, W band and so on. You might have heard that GPS is having frequency L1, L2 and L5. So, all these are belonging to the L band here and that is why they are written as L1, L2 and L5 frequencies. Similarly, we have so many bands here and they have different different applications. Especially when we talk about a radar, radar is basically X band, radar and other bands of the microwave they are listed here. You can see the applications 
I would like to indicate one thing that X band which is here it is used for the radar. So we have 8 to 12 gigahertz of the frequency range for X band. Moreover, you can see that L band, S band, C band and X band are used for the satellites. So different applications of satellite. So you can see here that satellite navigation that is GPS, cellular phones, satellite radio and the Wi-Fi also Bluetooth, cellular phones, satellite microwave relay and so on. Moreover, if you want to conduct some experiments using radar, in that case we will use F and D band here. So these are the applications and now let us compare the techniques that we have learned so far. One is lidar, one is photogrammetry or we can say multispectral because photogrammetry has three bands R, B and G, red, blue and green, other bands are also possible. So we also say it multispectral. At the same time we have radar now. So let us compare lidar offers only airborne while other two offers both space bond and airborne platforms that means these can be mounted on both airborne and space bond platform here. You can read all this thing yourself. I will only indicate the important aspects of the radar and I will compare them. First of all, it is a multi frequency compared to the lidar. Lidar is only single frequency. A multi frequency means the multi wavelength. Moreover, we can use the polarimetry and interferometry that principles of polarization and interference we can use in case of radar. However, it is not applicable here for the other two techniques. Further, since it is an active remote sensing technique, I can use in day and night similar to lidar, but the photogrammetry cannot be used here. Finally, there is a one fundamental advantage that is offered by the radar and that is it can see through the clouds. However, optical is blocked by the clouds and lidar is also blocked by the clouds. So there are some fundamental additional advantages that we have marked here. So radar is also a very very important technique today. So let us see what are the platforms for the radar. The first platform is airborne platform. There is one pulse that is being sent by the radar sensor that is mounted on the airborne platform. Then we have another one but at the same time we can also mount radar sensor on the spacecraft and that is called the side looking space bond radar here. You can see here that this system is called the side looking air bond radar. Just note it is not another looking radar. So far we have used camera in optical wavelength range and we have used the lidar in infrared range and both are nadir looking that means around the nadir they acquire the data. Radar is not the nadir looking it is side looking that if I draw the nadir it's nadir position first pulse starts from here itself and the last pulse is here itself so it is a side looking airborne radar. Similarly if you look into the space bond system it has mounted on the spacecraft and it is also a side looking space bond radar. This is another point indicated here but this is the first pulse and it is trying to target this point here. So let us look into the types of radars. We have two types of radars. One is imaging radar, the another is non-imaging radar. In case of imaging radar, the output is in the form of image from the reflected pulse. So the synthetic aperture radar and real aperture radar are the example of the imaging radars. However, we have the non-imaging radar also. Here we see that output in the form of plan position indicator. What is this plan position indicator or PPI? Let us say there is a, a transducer or there is a transmitter that is sending the radar pulses towards an object. We know that object is around but we want to detect its position. So when the transmitted pulses interact with the surface, surface generally returns back the reflected signal and that reflected signal is received by the receiver which is also associated with the transmitter only. So that is the way we can find out the position. However, in some cases it happens that the signal which is transmitted once it reaches to the body or the reflecting surface, it becomes very weak because of the large distance and as a result reflected signal will be further weak. We have some arrangement that there is a primary radar in the transmitter which is based on the ground surface and there is a moving object in the sky which is having a secondary radar. 
that secondary radar once it receives the signal which is very weak secondary radar transmits another signal and that signal is not weak and it is received by the receiver at the ground surface so what is the use of that i can find out the position of a moving object and generally this principle is used which is a non imaging radar principle for the atc air traffic controller atc on the ground surface is having a transmitter receiver assembly it is continuously transmitting the signals as soon as an aircraft comes in the range of the atc that is a reflective surface so once it receives the signal from the atc then it will start sending back or reflecting back the signal however signal is very very weak as we have already told the aircraft is also having a transponder or the secondary radar that secondary radar immediately understands that there is some kind of position indicator it transmits another pulse to the ground surface or the atc and using this logic we can find out the position of a moving object we are showing in the picture the plan position indicator and let us see that this is the location of the ground surface station atc and as soon as an aircraft comes in the range of this circles so this is the position the black dot to look at this position basically the secondary radar has sent the signal to the atc or to the station at the ground surface so that is the function of the atc and that uses the non imaging radar so what are the components of an imaging radar a system of radar that is transmitting the signal the signal is interacting with the surface reflected back towards the radar system radar system has a receiver and it is receiving this reflected back scatter of signal that is recorded in the form of image so that is imaging radar imaging radar has two components first is the hardware and other component is processor hardware consists of an transmitter receiver assembly and it transmits the modulated signal further it receives the reflected signal and it demodulates the received signal in two components one is phase component and another is quadrature component or the brightness is resolved in two components one is phase component another is quadrature component then it has analog to digital conversion as well as it does the motion compensation also so the motion compensation is similar to the image motion compensation of the photogrammetry then we have the processor it basically work on the transmitted and received signals that are generated by the hardware first of all it does the pulse compression and so what is the pulse compression radar signal has a certain wavelength range that is called the bandwidth over that bandwidth it transmits the signal now like lidar we have a peak at the center but around that peak we have some noise so what is the meaning of pulse compression we minimize the noise we compress the whole energy into very small wavelength range and we increase the height of the peak of overall signal what's the advantage of this pulse compression the basic accuracy it depends on the bandwidth of the frequency so the lower the bandwidth we have the higher accuracy and that's the purpose of pulse compression so we should always understand these fundamental concepts we have some range and azimuth filters for the received signals and then it generates the complex image from the received signal this signal is used to detection and as well as the estimation of average reflectivity further we also find out what is the reflectivity from various distributed scatterers the imaging radar has four types incoherent surface based radar they are neither looking the example is scatterometers so what is the incoherent remember in case of lidar we talked about two types of the reflector signal one is coherent and another is incoherent so lidar is originally coherent so now we are saying that radar can also treat the incoherent reflector signal as the, at the same time the coherent can also be treated similarly we have the incoherent side looking radars they are called side looking airborne radar please note that side looking airborne radar can also treat the coherent signal and rather we prefer coherent signal then we have coherent surface based radars and they are neither looking so one example is the range doppler radar finally we have coherent side looking radars they are called side looking and there's called synthetic aperture radar also in this module we are going to discuss only the coherent one now let us look into the technical perspective of the radar so it has parameters one is system parameter and another is scene parameters scene means terrain so let us look into the system parameter system consists of hardware and processor 
So whatever parameters we can relate to those system that we'll call it the system parameters. The system should have the sufficient stability to retain the phase that is the coherent property. Then the reflected signal should also be stored what we call is backscattered pulse or backscatter and then we should have a processor to work on the azimuth focusing. I would like to explain the term azimuth focusing. Let us say that this is the flight direction of the airborne radar and radar system is mounted on aircraft. The direction which is perpendicular to the flight direction and it is towards the surface of earth it is called the azimuth direction. So this is azimuth direction, this is azimuth direction so it is maintaining a 90 degree angle with the flight direction. So that direction is called azimuth direction. So what radar does, it transmits the pulse in the azimuth direction towards the ground surface. The pulse has some response or the reflected energy or what we call backscatter and backscatter is received by the receiver in order to improve the point estimation in the azimuth direction. We reduce the area in the azimuth direction where the pulse is interacting with the ground surface and that is called the azimuth focusing. That means receiver will acquire the energy or the reflected backscatter in certain area where the azimuth angle is 90 degree and that is called azimuth focusing. So what are the scene parameters? So one is the geometric condition that means I have terrain features so where are they located? Then we have radiometric conditions that is the brightness of the scene. That means what is the brightness coming from the reflected response or backscatter from the surface of earth at the same time what is the reflectivity of the terrain surface. So we need to calibrate remember in case of optical one we calibrate from the automatic systems what we call is camera software or similar to lidar also we have the radar system where some backscatter is coming and that backscatter has to be calibrated that means I should have some kind of the reference backscatter and compared to that back reference backscatter what is the received backscatter. So we will say that with respect to that reference this is value here. So that is called the calibration and we need to do the calibration for both geometric as well as radiometric conditions. So in this lecture we are going to talk about the geometric conditions only. In the next lecture we will talk about the radiometric conditions. So that is the small comparison here of the radar and camera and we have to understand what is difference between the radar system and the let us say other system maybe lidar or camera. So here we have a side looking airborne radar which is mounted on the aircraft shown here. It does not require any illumination because it is an active remote sensing technique. So this is first pulse and this is next pulse. At the same time there is a virtual camera and that is working in the presence of the illumination of the sun. This is the reflected energy in the optical region that is being received by the camera. Now you can see here that we have the concept of shadow in case of optical system. Similar to this thing in case of radar that radar is using microwave but microwave also creates shadow. If you see here that this point of the terrain it is interacting with the this pulse. Now beyond this point it may not go so this complete region will be in the shadow and radar is using microwave so whatever backscatter will be there that will be in the microwave region only. And secondly since we are considering only the coherent component so that only coherent part will be received. So here this is shadow. So that is the similarity as well as dissimilarity of the optical and the radar system that we just discussed. So it both creates the shadow but at the same time both work in the different wavelength ranges. What are the measurements of the side looking radar? or any radar system. First of all that image is formed using some observation. The first observation is geometry which is incident angle and the slant range. Then we have brightness and that is the pixel value and it is backscatter response of the transmitted signal from the terrain surface. This radar image then if I divide into the pixels. So each pixel let us say this pixel it is indicating three values one is incident angle, second is slant range and third is brightness. So brightness is the pixel value so a pixel has three 
such variables recorded. So let us look into the geometry of the side looking airborne radar. A radar system is mounted on the aircraft. This is the nadir point. So this is first pulse. So this is called the slant range. And this is called the ground range that is the distance from this point to the nadir point that is along the terrain or along the joint. Now let us consider the another pulse which is this and this is slant range and this is ground range. I hope you understand what is the meaning of slant range and ground range. So this angle which is formed from the nadir to the line of sight because this is the line of sight here. So this angle is called look angle. What about the angle from the horizontal? So let us draw the horizontal here and then this angle it is called the depression angle. So this is depression angle. So you can see here that look angle and depression angle are complementary to each other because the summation of the two angles is equal to 90 degree. What about the terrain? Or the terrain where the signal is interacting which is this point here. And if I draw a vertical line through this point in the direction of gravity, so this is the line in gravity direction, this angle which is shown in the animation, it is called incident angle. So I hope that animation has helped you to understand what is the look angle, depression angle, slant range, ground range and incident angle. So that is called the geometry of the side looking airborne radar. From this geometry you can see that look angle in case of airborne radar is equal to the incident angle here. But in case of space bond radar, the curvature of earth is very prominent and as a result incident angle is not equal to the look angle or in order to calculate the incident angle we should consider the curvature of the earth. So we will see all this thing in this lecture in coming slides. What is the slant range? It is the distance between a reflecting object the scatterer and the radar line of sight or the radar transmitter. What is the ground range? The distance from the nadir of radar to the scatterer. In order to convert this land range to ground range, we need to do some kind of rescaling or some kind of multiplication factor we have to devise. What is look angle? What is the depression angle? Look angle is angle between the vertical line from aircraft towards nadir and the radar line of sight. Similarly, depression angle is complement of the look angle. So it is angle from the horizontal to the radar line of sight. Then we have incident angle which is angle between the radar line of sight and the local vertical at terrain point. Then we have depression angle and incident angle. So now we have learned what is the slant range and ground range. What about the quality of that measurement? That is what is the resolution of those? So first define various type of resolution. Okay, let me tell you one thing that these resolution types which are special. Then we have radiometric resolution, temporal resolution and the spectral resolution. So these four types of resolutions are applicable to all remote sensing systems. And the definitions of these four terms are always consistent for all types of remote sensing systems. Let us look these four terms in context of a radar. First is special resolution. So the special resolution is ability of a sensor to separate two objects. It is similar to the optical system where we said that there are two pixels. If I want to differentiate two objects, they should be separated by certain distance and that is called the resolution of the system. The same definition is here. Now coming to the radiometric resolution, let us say you have some brightness values, for example green color. So even within the green color you have different shades or within black color you have different shades of gray. So the ability of a system to distinguish between these different levels of brightness is called radiometric resolution. Then we have temporal resolution. This term is mostly applicable for the satellite system because in case of satellite system, satellites can travel a particular point of earth at repetition or satellite can make the repetition over a certain point of the earth. And so we can detect the changes based on the its repetition interval. It could be one day, it could be one month, it could be one week and so on. So the repetition rate or the time interval after which a satellite tracks a certain point, it is called the temporal resolution of the satellite system. So this temporal resolution is not applicable or not relevant in case of air mount systems because aircraft is flown very few times and generally we do not prefer 
to repeat the surveys very frequently. Then we have spectral resolution which means the dividing the wavelength range in different different frequency ranges. So for example, optical system we have red, blue and green in the optical wavelength range. So there are three bands. So it has 0.1 micrometer wide bands. So that's the spectral resolution of the optical system. Same way in case of radar we have the some spectral bands. However, we are not going to include those things here. So basically spatial resolution and the radiometric resolutions are very important for the radar. In context of spatial resolution of radar, let us define few terms. The first is range resolution. It is ability of the sensor system to distinguish the two objects along the slant range and that is called the range resolution. Then we have azimuth resolution. So in the direction of azimuth, we have certain resolution. The ability to create a distinction between the two objects along the flight direction, it is called the azimuth resolution. We have defined slant resolution or we have defined azimuth resolution. They are along the line of sight. So what about the resolution on the ground surface? We define the resolution on the ground or terrain as ground range resolution and the ground azimuth resolution. So we need to calculate the range resolution for the ground surface by some mathematical logic here because we measure the resolution along the slant range. We are showing the range and azimuth resolution. Okay, You can see here that this is the line of sight here. This is azimuth resolution and that is being created on the ground surface here and since we are showing in the air that is mean we are basically projecting the same thing here on the air and this is range resolution here or slant range resolution here and this is azimuth resolution here. This is the line of sight that means this particular slant range can distinguish two objects if they are separated by this distance RR. Similarly, I can separate two objects if they are away from this distance RA here and this RR is given by C times the speed of the light and the tau. What is tau? It is the wavelength or it is the time range over which one wavelength of the radar signal travels. So you can understand this is the tau here, the time. So if I divide C into T divided by 2, so that is range resolution. Similarly, what is the ground resolution? If I divide this range resolution by cos D where D is depression angle, so it is called the ground resolution or ground range resolution. Similarly, we have the azimuth resolution which is given by lambda by 2 beta. Yes, I would like to indicate here it is given by lambda by 2 beta in case of synthetic aperture radar. In case of real aperture radar, it is lambda by beta A. Once we get this idea, we should also know what is the relationship between the resolution and pixel. Let us see there is a footprint on the heterogeneous area. That means I have certain background here in one footprint. That is the majority of area. I call it background. And then we have three targets A, B and C of different areas. These footprint will be divided into small small elements and each element will be one pixel. So when we note down the slant range for each pixel, what will happen? We know the distance of point C is higher. So it will appear like this distance of B is less than C and the nearest point is A. So I will get three such lobes or the peaks and this curve is called the impulse response here. In case of impulse response, if I draw the distance and if I draw the power, I will have such lobes here. And that is the idea here. Based on this only, I need to understand that there are some different different features and rest of the things are noise. So this curve, again I repeat, is called impulse response. So that is backscatter. So based on this data, what do we determine from this? First of all, we determine the number of samples, that is number of pixels in a footprint. For each pixel, we will find out what is the brightness and what is the slant range as well as incidence angle. And then what is the spatial resolution here? How to estimate the spatial resolution of the radar system? The logic is similar to the LIDAR. 
First of all, we will go for the 50% or 3 decibel logic. What is 50%? As I told, if reflected backscatter has the power more than 50%, this is the appropriate signal that has been received from some surface. That is called 50% logic here or sometimes it is also called 3 decimal logic. What is the meaning here? So, if I take P received power and P transmitted power and if ratio is 0 0.5 which is indicated here 50% and if I take the log of this one on base 10, then I will get minus 0 0.3 and this quantity is called bell. So, the ratio of power and its log. So, if I multiply it by 10, minus 3 and it is called decibel. The 50 percent logic is equivalent of 3 decibel logic. So, if I have the minimum 3 decibel power from the reflected wax scatter, I will say that it is appropriate signal. Now, we can see here that at system level design, the resolution is equal to the inverse of the system bandwidth. Bandwidth is frequency range of this transmitted pulse. So, if transmitted pulse has smaller frequency range, I will have superior spatial resolution. So, that is one estimate of the spatial resolution here and that is the how do we measure it. Let us see there is an impulse response here and we are saying that this is impulse width and what is impulse width? Suppose there is a feature C which we show in the previous slides. This value which is almost 50 percent here, remember in case of LIDAR we defined FWHM, the same logic I am using here and I am saying that this is impulse width. So, I have some impulse width here. The special resolution is distance between the two center line of these peaks. And what is pixel? Pixel is half of this resolution or the distance between here to here. This is called a pixel here. and that is a resolution here. And you can see here that resolution is 2 times of pixel. Pixel is delta r and resolution is rr. Then I can write here this thing. What is the importance of pixel and the special resolution or what is the relationship between the spatial resolution and the pixel in case of radar? First of all, incident angle and slant range are indicated by a pixel here. So, it is pixel value. I can and pixel value will also have brightness. Then the pixel brightness here corresponds to a reflected response or the backscatter from a sample or the pixel of a footprint that we have discussed here. So, originally pixel represents only the brightness value that means to a certain location on the ground which is not incident angle and slant range and at this location I have certain brightness value and that is represented by a pixel like this. Here we would like to highlight that the size of the pixel here it does not correspond to the size of the pixel on the sensor because there is no sensor like photogrammetry where we have 3 mm size to 4 mm size and it is having so many pixels. No, that concept is not applicable in case of radar. Radar does not have any sensor of certain size rather it only records the reflected backscatter and reflected backscatter is stored in some numerical value and that numerical value is represented by a pixel. So, as such pixel does not have any size on the sensor, but at the same time when we define some pixel on the ground surface, it has a size of spatial resolution. So, there is no connection between the pixel on the sensor and the pixel on the ground surface because as such there is no sensor which has certain format or which is some kind of storing device. In case of optical sensor we have, we do not have such facility. And as a result now we can say that the pixels which are represented by the image of a radar, it does not represent any pixel size on the sensor. At the same time, 
it is just a displaying the brightness values at specific locations. So now we have collected such information and we have created one array and that array is called radar image. Pixel size on the ground is decided by the impulse width here. I am saying pixel size on the ground and not on the sensor. The so maximum resolution is represented by the difference between the two adjacent impulse responses or pixels. The maximum spatial resolution or the best spatial resolution should be equal to at least two pixels there in case of radar. And so that is the relationship. Now we have seen that what is range and azimuth resolution and because of the azimuth focusing very small amount of signal is backscattered because we are focusing at a 90 degree exactly from the flight track and that is called azimuth focusing and because of the azimuth focusing I have very low signal and I have very low resolution in azimuth direction or the parallel to the flight track and that is given by the lambda by beta a where beta a is complete beam width and it is also given by lambda rl by l where l is the length of real antenna. R is slant range and lambda is the wavelength of the signal. Or radar wavelength in the microwave region and that is azimuth resolution here. In order to improve the reflected backscatter from that azimuth location, scientists have devised a simple mechanism and that is called the synthetic aperture radar. So let us look into the SAR synthetic aperture radar which is an another geometric dimension of the radar. So that is synthetic aperture radar, this is a satellite or aircraft and it is moving from this point, this point and so on. This is beam width here, beam width of the real short antenna. From this point itself, this point P is visible or it is coming in the footprint of the one beam width from this position. Similarly, when aircraft comes here, that we have complete footprint belonging to this point and then finally when aircraft comes to this position we have the last point or if still we this point is touching this thing that means this point P here it is being imaged from here to here. So effectively we have observed the point P from the long distances multiple times and that has improved the overall quality of the backscatter from this point P. because the received signal is re received from the multiple looks. I can say that I have increased the length of the antenna from this point to this point. This concept is synthetic aperture radar. So you can see here, this is the length of synthetic antenna. That means I have increased the length of the antenna or length of the receiving antenna for a larger distance. And that is called the synthetic length. In fact, the real length is this much only. Whatever the length is there that we indicated by length L. So now we have developed a synthetic antenna here or what we call aperture. So this technique is called synthetic aperture radar. So let us look into the geometric aspects of the synthetic aperture radar. So it has a wider time bandwidth product. We'll see into that. So it helps in locating the corresponding reflection on a specific mapping surface and it also has some Doppler frequency criteria. So first of all, let me tell you what is Doppler frequency. We can see here that because of the movement of aircraft and aircraft is trying to see this point P from multiple locations, when it comes from this position to this position, remember the effect of Doppler, if the source comes closer to the point here, this range is small, R, here R1 is bigger, this is R1 and this is R2. So R1 and R2 are bigger than R. So as this aircraft come closer to point P, I will have change in the frequency and that is what we call the Doppler effect. This Doppler shift in the frequency is given by V radial velocity of the aircraft divided by lambda. Now we can see here that range is Rx which is inclined range and that is the original range R which is shortest range here and this X is the length of antenna here. What is available time? The time that aircraft takes to cross this distance on the ground is called RBA range into beta is beam width, this is the time available. Now Doppler bandwidth is given by this and time 
bandwidth product is given by the multiplication of these two and it is this. So now we have the azimuth resolution which is this and you can see here it is improved by two times compared to the real aperture radar. So now this is V radial in order to calculate the Doppler frequency shift. So this radial velocities of aircraft. In case of space bond system, we still have the facility of the synthetic aperture radar. In that case, a spacecraft is moving on an elliptical orbit. So the length of the antenna will be defined on the elliptical orbit of the spacecraft. There is a spacecraft shown in the animation here. This is the another position of the spacecraft after moving the distance x. So here this is point. So this is the range r. So this is another position. This is the distance along the geoid or the curved surface of the earth. This is the range r and this is the another range rx at a distance x. So this range r x is a function of x here. This is the speed of the radar beam. It is called VB, speed of the radar beam on the surface of earth. Now this is the mechanism of the synthetic aperture radar in case of space bond radar system. So this is system parameter rx is given by this and you can see here that VB divided by V spacecraft will modify this x square by 2r and we have this expression. Similarly, the time available that means the time in order to cross this point here that is the footprint it will be RBA divided by VB and then Doppler bandwidth is given by this formula and finally the time bandwidth product we have this thing V spacecraft by VB into this. So we can see here compared to the airborne system all the terms are modified by this ratio of the speed of the spacecraft to speed of the beam. The other parameters like single look azimuth resolution that means as if we have observed that azimuth from many many locations that is over distance x but finally the expression because we take the brightness values and we average it over multiple looks and finally the azimuth as if we are looking from one look it is given by this value and you can see here it is also improved by two times. What about the Doppler frequency rate? It is given by this formula. So now we are comparing the swath of the two system. One is space bound radar and another is air bound radar. In case of air bound, we need to have the 30 degree to 40, 85 degree of look angle and then it will create some swath. Assume that I want to create the same swath using the satellite radar. I need only from 23 degree to 24 degree that means only a difference of 2 degrees of the look angle. That means look angle is very small in case of space bond because the spacecraft is situated at a height of 1000 kilometers or so, similar range. Aircraft is situated at very less distance, maybe some kilometers. We can see here that the higher altitude of the spacecraft, it covers larger area, larger footprint and as a result, I have low resolution compared to the air bond system. But at the same time, in case of spacecraft system, the incident angle value are very small and that is the advantage somehow because I am getting the proper reflectance from a surface and that is why it increases the average reflectivity but it has low resolution and so accuracy is also low. So we can see here that incidence angle is one of the most important specification of the radar system whether it is a space bound system or it is air bound system and we have done the comparison also. We have almost finishing the geometric aspects of radar system, whether it is the space mount, whether it is air mount or whether it is the real aperture or it is uh, synthetic aperture. So we have finished all the geometric aspects that is relevant to lecture series in this module. Let us talk about the type of reflectors. We have two type of reflectors. Let us say there is surface like this and transmitted pulse is coming this way. So it is reflecting from here, then here and returning back towards the receiver and that is called the dihedral reflectors. Then we have the trihedral reflector. Let us assume that there is a cube or what we call cubical in our offices here at one surface the transmitted pulse is impinging then it is going to this surface and finally the horizontal surface. So there are three returns one here, second here, third here and reflecting back towards the receiver. And such reflectors are called 
trihedral reflectors. So here we conclude this lecture and we have realized what are the geometric aspects of the radar system. So with this I would like to thank you and we have taken some of the images from these sources about the electromagnetic spectrum. Thank you, thank you very much.